So welcome to Bargoed. There were uh, Bargoed is a, a mining town in the upper Rumney Valley of South Wales. Um, great mining area. There were collieries here, three at least, that um, set the record at one time for coal production. Um, but in common with most of the mining areas of South Wales and indeed all over the place, the mines have gone, the mines have been closed down and uh, that obviously left a problem. Now the council, government have spent lots of money here, they've dealt with the problems of some of the slag heaps um, and some of the other stuff that's been left behind. The bottom of the valley where the industry was is, is now a country park and as it's gone it's left a great deal of problems behind. The thing is, while they've spent the money to regenerate the town, it's taking much longer to heal the scars that have been left when the industry died. It's almost as if part of the town died as well. It's obvious, isn't it, when we look around the world that it's not as it should be. There are people who are, are sick, people who are evil, and great problems of pollution, global warming, poverty, child abuse, crime. That's just bargains. I'm sure it's the same in wherever you're watching this. And yet we have a God who promises, Behold, I'm making all things new. Our God has a plan of redemption, a plan of regeneration, if you like, to renew the face of the earth that was ruined by Adam's fall. Sin and death entered the world, everything went wrong. And at the center point of this plan is, is Jesus, the Lord Jesus. Right at the middle of it, his death and his resurrection represent God's answer to the problem of evil and the beginnings of him making all things new. Jesus rose again on that first Easter day in a glorious new body. Paul says he was the first fruits from the dead, the first of the new creation. He, in a way, is the prototype of a new humanity, the first one. He was the beginning. He's now gone to reign with God in heaven and is waiting for the day when he'll return, when he'll come back. And that's the day when we won't just see these glimpses of redemption that we've seen, and we see every day when people turn to Jesus, when healing happens, but that we'll see complete redemption. The Bible tells us quite a lot about that, what that will look like. There'll be the defeat of all of God's enemies. 2 Thessalonians 2 uh, verse 8 talks about the defeat of the Antichrist, the devil's ultimate weapon, Satan's ultimate weapon, who will be slain by the breath from Jesus' mouth. This isn't going to be a fair fight. It's definitely going to be uh, an easy one for God when it happens. Death itself will be defeated at the end of all things when Jesus returns. And then there'll be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. All together, this is what the Bible teaches us. And the just and the unjust will stand before the Lord Jesus and the books will be opened and there'll be judgment. We'll be judged based on what we've done, how we've lived, and most of all, how we've responded to Jesus. And then there'll be a time of recreation, a moment of recreation where the heavens and the earth will be remade. The Bible gives us four pictures of this. first one is childbirth. It talks about the new creation being sort of born out of the womb of the old creation. second picture is marriage. Heaven and earth combining, joined together forever. No more separation between God and his people. He will be our, pe he will be our God and we will be his people. No longer separation between God and creation, but, but consummation, oneness perfect union. No more sun because God and the Lamb will be our light. Consummation. Third picture is it's a picture of victory. It talks about the kingdom of God swallowing up all the other kingdoms of the world. Of God's government becoming the one that rules and reigns and provides for everything. And the fourth picture, which is one of the most beautiful I think, is, is, is a strange one to us and it's led to this doctrine of the rapture. The idea that we'll go and be whisked away from the bad creation to go off to be with God forever. But nobody believed that from before about 1830. And so what happened, where they get it from is this passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, where the, the language being used is of people being caught up in the air to meet the Lord Jesus and to greet him. 
but the language, the, the picture that they're using there is one of the Roman Empire, of Caesar having left his city to go off on a campaign, returning home victorious. And they see him coming, and they go out to meet him, and going out to meet him, they celebrate with him, and then they come into the city together. They're accompanying him, him in as a glorious procession to, um, to start the party in earnest, really. It's a wonderful picture of how things will be at the end. We'll be caught up with Jesus. The dead will rise first. We'll go up to be with them in the air. And then together, we'll sweep down to the new heavens and the new earth to take possession of the thing that God has been building for 2,000 years. We think he built the earth in seven days. 2,000 years will be well worth waiting for. And of course, we don't know when Jesus is going to return. It could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be sometime soon. How is God making all things new? Well, obviously he did it in Jesus, but we don't see him making the whole world new all at once. He rearranges the world, renews the world, makes it right by making people right, one at a time. And that's actually how we know that he's going to rearrange the whole of creation at the end of it, because of what we see him doing day to day in my life, in your life and in the lives of the people he wants you to be sharing the good news with. We see the kingdom breaking in now, the future world, the new age to come, breaking in now as we live the Christian life, as we do the things that Jesus did, as we say, speak the words to people that Jesus once spoken, as we share his love with them in practical ways. We see the kingdom breaking in now, we see glimpses of it. Some of the work we're doing here is fantastic. We're working with some of the poorest in the town, some of the people who just have given up on having second chances. And it's fantastic that we're able to offer them in our community work second chances. We're building up lots of little stories of redemption, lots of little glimpses of, of the big picture of what God is up to, and of what we pray he'll be doing more and more here in Bargoed and in our midst. And I pray he'll be doing in your church as well but the fullness is still to come. The world isn't as it should be, we know that. Not because the church doesn't try hard or pray or because we're lacking something particularly, but because God will one day sweep in and sweep all this away and replace it with something much, much better. There are a bunch of implications for you in this. Firstly, um, well, there's a war going on. There's a fight going on between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world. It doesn't mean that the world itself, the earth, is a wonderful thing. God's plan involves a new, a renewed earth. But the, the powers in charge of the earth are run by the devil. And so you're either on the side of good or you're on the side of bad. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And so there's no sitting on the fence. There's nothing less than full-hearted discipleship that's worthy of the kingdom of God. It's the first implication. Second implication is that in the meantime, before God finishes new creation, there's a difficult place to live. There's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of crying. There's a lot of, of grief in this world. It's not easy. We will be hated. We will be hurt. We will be persecuted. Certainly Christians in lots of places are persecuted. But we've read the end of the story, as Billy Graham said. I've read the end of the story and it turns out all right. That it's worth the persecution. It's worth the suffering. Because he's at work in those things, ultimately for our good and for his glory. And God isn't finished with you yet. Third thing is that, well, there's nothing bad or wrong in the physical. Sometimes, you know, Christians in history have fallen into the trap of thinking that the physical world is, is dirty and bad and God is going to sweep down and rescue us from it, pluck us out of it. But no, the physical world was part of God's idea. It's what he wanted. It's a beautiful thing. His answer isn't to do away with it, it's to make it right. Adam and Eve, before they fell, were given that job of subduing the world, of farming it, of running it with God and for God. 
and we don't go back to a garden, we go to a city where God has purposes for us and plans for us. Good work for us to do, not the kind of boring, frustrating, tedious kind we often get stuck in now, but wonderful, fulfilling, life-giving work. Fourth implication of this is for our mission, collectively as Christians, and it's that mission must be holistic. If God is interested in the whole of creation, the whole of life, then it's not just enough to share the gospel with somebody in terms of words. You have to love them. You have to meet their needs. You have to campaign for justice, which is putting right the wrong things in the world, campaigning against the world systems which would oppress the poor and hurt people, cause injustice to be there, protect people from violence, those sorts of things. Justice is a fundamental part of mission. Social action, as I've said, you can't preach the gospel to an empty stomach, John Wesley used to say. You have to be meeting people's needs sometimes in order to get a hearing. And actually creation care can be part of our mission as well. You know, as we contribute to the regeneration of an area or the redemption of a building, then um, that in itself points to the truth of a God who is recreating the universe. And then the fifth implication is that every little bit you can do to help the new kingdom come is important. There's nothing you can do that is insignificant in God's economy. Even if it's just smiling at somebody that he asks you to smile at or sharing a kind word. That's significant. Nothing you do for God, however small, is wasted because it's all going to be caught up and it's all going to be rewarded in the new kingdom. It's all going to be judged. So live well. Love well. Look after each other well. Live together well. That his kingdom may come in your life, in the lives of the people around you. And on that glorious day when Jesus returns, you'll hear those words, well done, good and faithful servants.